and 50 degrees is going to be our, our new heat wave. So heavens, you know, we've got to we've got to really stick by. I want to say one more thing, sorry, because I'm really a building historian. Um, I've ended up making programs about modern architecture, but I have books at home of, of, of um, 18 to 19, about 18 to 19th century painting books, wood graining and marbling and fake stained glass, all the kind of things that people did in the 18th and 19th century. And I've got book, lovely books, templates of architecture from the Georgian period. And one thing you realize when you look at these books is that Georgian houses and Regency houses and Victorian houses were really quite, they were quite sophisticated, the windows and the openings they had in them, to prevent these problems even then. So if you, if you might have seen the occasional Regency townhouse in Cheltenham, for example, and um, there the, the townhouses still had these big canopies and wrought iron balconies. Many of these were, of course, were ripped off Georgian buildings in the UK before the First World War for munitions to melt down and make guns, and in the Second World War too. So we've lost a lot of our external solar shading that we had. What's quite remarkable is that many Georgian houses that didn't have this had shutter boxes fitted on the outside of the building, like a little sort of pair of draped curtains, projecting outside the building, timber box, inside which was an external blind, which could be pulled out. And these were sometimes decorated and painted with oil paint so that you could pull them down and have, have sort of translucent light coming to it, so they give you kind of an effect, rather than many of the products here do. And, um, and sometimes they were, they were more heavy than that and were used uh, for, 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 to, to block light out completely. And we, it's like so many things in buildings, is if you look back at the way that our forebears built and the consideration they gave to the engineering and the function of the building, they were far more sophisticated. They had a natural appreciation of the science of how a building worked. It was, in a way, far, far exceeded that of most of us today. We, we and I say, I joke, you know, but in Germany, for example, you know, I'm sure many of you work within the German market or have experience of it, you'll know that Germans love to operate their buildings like machines. They, they, they're really proud of the engineering performance. And the standard British solution um, in terms of heating and ventilation is to uh, control the temperature of our buildings by turning the thermostat up to max and then opening the windows to control the temperature. <laughs> and, I, I, you know, we just, we're just so far, so far behind. And as I say, building breaks. I've answered that question. <laughs> Thank you for that comprehensive art. What, what you're probably saying as well is that we can't blame you. Yeah, you can't blame me. Can't blame all I do, all we do is make programs. Absolutely. As you know, it's, a, it's actually on more than one occasion, people have said to me, are oh, we fitting external louvers? It happened in this series in Derbyshire. They had their balcony to go on, and the, the balcony had incorporated into an external louver um, controls for, to stop the, this big glazed wall from overheating. Um, so that would be episode four, I think, episode four, but so three weeks ago. Lovely couple uh, in Derbyshire, and, and building their kind of family for, their home for kind of three generations of the same family. So I go along for the finals, everything's tickety boo it's all beautiful, furnished, the whole thing, lovely, all ready for the sheep to come and the raised beds to be put in. And are there any blinds? No, there's not. You know, they're, they're not there, they just still haven't put them in. And it, you think, just please, just, Finish your building. Good Because they ran out of money. Probably. Well, they yeah, they got the sofas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Claire, are you okay to roam with the mic? Because I think Kevin's answered that comprehensively. So let's go. I see, I've got my me. one answer that yeah, I have ready for today. Absolutely, the day. I have five questions. So <laughs> who has a question, please? If you can pop your hand up, don't be shy. We have a question down here on the bottom right. Thank you. Oh, Kevin. Um, curtains, as far as the sort of interior look of the house yes. is concerned, people seem to have a, a bigger version to them now. Generally, Jackson. <laughs> as far as the, the continental projects, you seem to see, still see curtains in the continental projects, yeah. not in many of the UK ones. It seems a design compromise, which I don't think they are. What was your opinion on that? So, my mother, who's 90, has only one thing to say about my job. Which is what? Why does nobody put curtains in? Um, having said that, I think all, all you know they say uh, 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 any good design for a house should have what's called a naked window, which is a, a window somewhere in the village where you can look out 
and be absolutely starless. <laughs> and that, because it implies some degree of privacy. Um, but I, I, yeah, I, it, gets, it gets me. Because, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, because I'm, I'm currently uh, putting in some um, uh, honeycomb, you know, uh, blood for, for improved thermal performance. And in fact, I was looking at this uh, with Joe, who said, yeah, I live in a new building, and we've got relatively small windows, and I put these in, and you've got, you've got double glazing. And it's made a big difference. To, even on a modern build with a double glazing um, system, it's made quite a difference to the performance. So um, I'm quite a fan of, um, I'm quite a fan of curtains. I'm also quite a fan of, well, depending who you are, if you're an interior designer, could be even noirs. And if you're an architect, you call them shears. Um, nets, net curtains. And um, because I like uh, talk, talking with your, with your president earlier about this, actually. The idea that you can use these um, these layers in a building in terms of thermal performance. The curtains are great for that. Um, you can use them for privacy. You can use them actually to create the difference between night and day in terms of the you know, the, the surroundings, the, the decoration, the colours, and so forth. And you can use them to modulate light and to you know back to light, front light, um, layer up. So you you know all that. I mean, it's the stuff you all go cast you for a living, you know. Um, but I'm a fan of curtains. I was also just saying to David that my, my um, former colleague of mine, Max, um, who's, who uh, runs a, 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 an environmental consultancy, he said to me that um, if, you, if you use insulated shutters, if you build insulated shutters as part of your project um, around your buildings, then bear in mind that in winter, it's only light for eight hours a day when you need them. And so for two thirds of the time, you can insulate your house even across the, the glazed part of the building, which still remains, of course, you know, even with double and triple glazing, still remains one of the places where you can leave the most heat. Um, and uh, we had a project on Grand Designs about five years ago, uh, Saffron and Fred up in Derbyshire, it was a, uh, building their house. It was a passive house built against a cliff face, and they were using the thermal mass of the rock and the thermal mass of their exposed internal concrete blocks. And um, and then they, they built themselves some insulated shutters across the big glazed south facing uh, section of the front of the building. And, and I think that's uh, you know, really a nice, nice option. But yeah, curtains, yeah. Interlined curtains. Currently, across, across my front door, I've got a bit, uh, my grandma, and there's a big interlined curtain and a sausage across the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> the, those are two key, two, two key things. I have recently, Experimenting when people start talking about the energy crisis, I bought online at Amazon for 80 quid. I bought um, a, a, an insulated, it's not so much a curtain, it's more like a kind of duvet, the kind of thing you see in service lifts in hotels. You know, they hang this big kind of quilted thing, which is like super robust. It's not like a duvet, it's just a big kind of heavy industrial thing. And I'm, 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 I'm sort of waiting to see uh, or to hear about somebody this winter who's, who's decided that they can do without that back door or do it and just you know basically put a big slab of insulation, take a big slab of insulation into that opening. Because um, you know and it's what it, curtains are very good for me. Thank you very much for that question. Curtains, so curtains question. Thank you. 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 And then you look at the building of Paris with its massive pyramid. That would be my thoughts out of the window. What are your views on the styling of windows, bearing in mind the architecture? Yeah, well, of course, most people just see the window as a means to let light in, a way of letting heat out, capturing a view. That's it. Um, whereas, actually, I think. Um, I think I'm probably more excited by the idea of what you can do with the treatment to a window or an opening um, in terms of how you modulate light and how you kind of alter it. Um, and, you know, using layers. And, um, and I'm also a big fan of, 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 um, of openings which aren't glazed. So um, I remember going to see Sarah Featherstone, so she's a great architect. And she built a house on the Welsh borders, and 
uh, I learned from that house that you can, if you decide that you're going to put a, a big window in, you can spend an absolute fortune on a you know, semi broken aluminium frame or a really brilliant, you know, kind of composite timber thing with aluminium skin and, you know, clever locking closes and openers. Or you can just buy a big double glazing unit and get your joiner to make a frame and just plonk it in. And it's about a fifth of the price. What she did was get her joiner to make a little opener next to that window frame, same height, narrow width, which was a shutter. And I liked it so much to the extent that in my own business, when we built some social housing about 12 years ago, we, we started to incorporate this idea into into building. So in a way, I kind of I, li I like the fact that if, if you you can with something like a shutter, you know, and using a security grill behind it and an insect mesh, you can and then you know you can use a roof light in your top of your house, um, V lux whatever. <coughs> you can crack that open and you can live, you know, open your shutter during the day, go up to work in the summer and have the thing passively stacked ventilated. And um, I know I'm straying away from your question here, but my real point is why I'm very excited by the fact that a, a building that has openable shutters, which is secure for people and also res you know, resistant to insect penetration, um, that's a building wearing its eco credentials on its sleeve, you know. And, um, and I like the idea that, yeah, it, it, instead of going for a really expensive, super complicated posh system, you just put a big double glazing unit in and then do clever things with, with shutters. And even, I mean, I've seen the wonderful thing. We've had a few House of the Year shortlisted projects and, a, and one winner, which is in Scotland actually, which I have to say was lovely, where it was a, a, a modern building in, in imitation of old barns in Scotland and timber clad. And it had these huge sliding doors which ran across all of the windows. And they were effectively, they were on those big agricultural rolling rails, you know, like a big uh, shed. And um, they were external shutters of the building for when it got really rough on the northwest coast of Scotland. It, yeah, I, I'm all for, in a way, I'm all for kind of the, the, the window being a starting point for a bit more of, a, of an adventure architecturally. Uh, you know, and I think that's, that's very exciting. On the topic of windows, though, Kevin, do you we are building more mass-built homes, do you expect them to be smaller? This is a really good question. So if you're building a passive house, you know, there are a few, if you want passive house certification, which you do if you live in Germany, but people in the UK just aren't to sort that. I'm not going to spend an extra grand just getting a piece of paper. I'll build near to near as damn it, but I'll, you know, if you're going to build that way, um, the, the, the general, the received wisdom is that you build as square as possible. The ideal sh shape for a passive house is a sphere, but no one's going to build that. And um, and you put all your glazing on the south side to maximise solar gain in the winter, you shade in the summer, and you then put no uh, no windows on the north side. In fact, you just put books on the north side. You, you line your house with books as an extra layer of insulation. Um, so I. You know, you can be very curious about this, but if your great view that you have is to the north and you want to enjoy that, then you should perhaps consider putting in a window there. And, and I think the problem about, um, the real problem, I think, about the, the rigidity of a single pure approach is that it doesn't account for what might be there technologically to help you, and it doesn't account for context, doesn't account for privacy or for other people or neighbours or, or uh, it doesn't account for joy or delight in its function. And the great art of architecture, I think, is in delivering a highly performing building, yeah, but one which is also one you want to spend time in. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that there was a window that you like if you could be naked in. I don't have any of those windows because they're all about that big, so uh, I'd buy it. Well, it would just be a small piece of your anatomy. Oh, indeed, yeah. <laughs> um, Question down here, please, uh, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, this is a historical question, really. Um, the British blinds industry is fairly different from the continental European one, uh, and because way back in the day, I don't know when, 
nearly all uh, continental European countries decided to make their windows open inward, requiring shading on the outside. Yeah. We, and I believe America and Canada and anywhere else we colonized, um, uh, chose to have the windows opening outward, so we have an interior blinds industry. Do you have, uh, can you fill me in any more about how that came to be, or do you know much about it? I don't. No, I'm going to change the subject very swiftly and say that the, 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 um, the turning circle on a, uh, a, a, a splayed entrance, so if you're going to planning commission, it would have been a splayed entrance or a new drive or a roundabout. The turning circle on which that is based is from a 1932 car, which is an indication of just how our building legislation is mired in, yeah, Nobody bothering to change it. Um, so once something comes into being, it's remarkable how little and how infrequently it's updated. It's also remarkable, and I think the Coach of Sustainable Homes bears witness to this, um, it's also remarkable how much um, pressure from very large players in very large industries has on government policy. And um, I can't really tell whether or not Pilkington's, you know, Decided in 1936 that the windows should open in this. Well, yeah, but what I will say is, um, is that um, so in, in, in houses from the 16th century that in this country that I've been to visit, um, the windows open outwards, and so we the, the tradition in this country is is ancient, and it may well be that actually there's a really odd reason in Europe why there's a inwards and not outwards. I really don't know. Um, now I feel as though this is precisely the kind of question I knew was going to happen. <laughs> it was going to be, it was going to be a, a rabbit hole. Down it's, which we, job. Sorry. it's a rabbit hole down which we go. Thank you. Uh, it's what Google was invented. Thank you, John Sinclair. Have we got any more questions from the audience, please? Have you got another one? I have plenty. Go on, then. I'm not going to see it. Go on, more. Oh, there's a gentleman on front row. Hello. Uh, given that, Kevin, it's become almost a cliche of the grand designers that uh, your subjects go, tend to go way over budget, I wonder when, when you're putting together stuff for yourself and you're doing your own projects, how successful are you at keeping under budget? So, that budget question, which you know I always ask and I'm always made to ask at the end, it's not one I would ever ask naturally. I don't think it's any of my business. <laughs> And I don't think it's any viewer's business to know how much people spend. It's a bit like saying to somebody in, you know, on live on television, how much do you earn? Go on, how much do you earn? I mean, we don't do that. We don't do that in the pub. We don't do that at the dinner table. Uh, in America, they do. Um, my grand side stuff show, so maybe that's, that's what I'm My producers are so keen. The channel are always so keen. Everybody tells me that they are so keen to know how much people spend. And I'm, I'm not bothered. So I, um, I, my view is, is that the budget huh, is one, it's notional, two, it's completely subject now to the vagaries of the market, so we might as well not bother asking, oh, it's gone up by 28%, what a surprise, that's because your materials have gone up by 40%, yeah, um, and I, I, I sort of I find the I find the question a bit prurient. I don't enjoy asking it, and I like to gloss over that as quickly as possible. And as for the deadline thing, when are you going to be in by? You know, because the only thing producers want to know is when we get the series out. Will it be done by July next year? That's the only thing they're interested in. You know, and so often I get a project in, and my producer says, "What do you think?" I go, "Well, I don't know really. It's not. I'm not sure. 50-50." He said, "No, no, they're going to be finished by June." <laughs> and uh, I said, okay, okay, then let's do it. And then, of course, they're not. They're finished three years later. Um, so I once asked a, um, a Sami uh, reindeer farmer in northern Sweden, who, who is where the, the you know, vast herds of reindeer are kept. I once asked him how many reindeer he had. And the room fell silent. And the interpreter said, you can't ask that question. It's like asking. How, how much he hurts. And I had to retract the question for him in the interview. So there you go. Every culture has its own taboos. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen this. Can I? Oh, no. No, no. Um, that's, if you didn't hear that, that's the mention of where airport was here. No, there we go. How much was the budget, by the way? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's the good point, isn't it? Because look at any single government budget for any single government scheme, and it never comes down, does it? And I sort of think that whether it's um, governments, local authorities, house builders, whether it's us individuals, you know, whether you're buying a new car or a... I mean, I've never met anybody who's bought a new car and I went into the showroom and I wanted to buy that Audi with all those tricks and the knobs on the twiddles, and actually, I've got the one that hasn't got those, the same as self -fine friend. No one I've ever met says that. They, they cover it up, they post rationalize it, but fundamentally we all come out of the showroom with something that we didn't want to get, we'd spend more money than we could. And people are the same with us. They say, oh, I bought that big roll top bath, I bought that important slide out fridge and the electrically heated gates because the house mirrors, you know, the house didn't, the house isn't the person. The house doesn't merit anything, it's, it's you. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's all eating. And I'd say one more thing, sorry, just by way of closing my, my response, is that it's not open book accounting. I never see the figures. So if people can make it up, I possibly do. Kevin, your favourite project for grand design? Is there, is there, I know you've seen so many. There's been 21, yeah. 22 series now. Yeah, yeah. So I think we've done about two, 200, 250. Um, What's the project that sticks out in your mind? Is it well, the chap that the broke up with his family? Listen, um, and let me tell you about filming. So filming involves standing around in the mud, doing nothing. Motto of filming is hurry up and wait. And so we're lucky out of one, I mean, we're on site all day. Sometimes we're waiting for a plane, we're waiting for a builder to get out of the back of the shop, we're waiting for get some silence because everybody's on their impact screwdrivers. Uh, sometimes it's a producer in the back of the shop on his mobile phone that we're trying to get out of the way. And uh, sometimes we're waiting for, we're always waiting for sound. The common joke in television is why does thunder always follow lightning and the answer is because even God has to wait for sound. Um, so the yeah we're always waiting for something and then we do the interview and the interview will cut down to about 30 to 40 seconds maybe but it will take probably an hour to do hour and a half maybe piece to camera well sometimes I can do them in one and sometimes there's 17 takes so you know yeah. Well, today. well, yeah, luckily I haven't had to do it. Uh, but the, 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 the real point about it is, is it involves standing around, getting cold and miserable. And, um, and I've lost, I'm sorry, I've got completely distracted by the grimness of the experience now. <laughs> so, the question was, favourite, favourite, yeah, that's right. So you could, it, ergo, right, following, there is a logic here, right, following my logic. The best projects are always those that are really close to a good pub. <laughs> and I joke, but actually it is sort of true. Um, and you know, one of my favorite projects was the two girls, Indy and Rebecca, you know, on Sky. And they've got this beautiful little, beautiful crafted thing designed by this practice on Sky called War Studio. It's a beautiful little wooden diamond shaped building. Tiny, tiny building, one bedroom. And, um, and they're lovely people, both artists, one of them drives the local bus. Um, it's on the, the only road that goes around the sky, so if you ever go to sky, you can see this building. Um, you may even get driven on the bus by Rebecca. Um, indeed, sorry. And, um, and, and 